Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for whoever is here. Um, this is our first time trying this, and I'm trying to run it. So um, this is going to be an adventure. I see that we have multiple attendees. Um, I'm hoping that this is streaming on Facebook Live. I hit the button to tell it to do that, but I'm not sure that it actually worked because I feel like something else happened when we practiced this before. But um, so we're going to try to keep this pretty informal, as you can tell. Um, we're going to um, try to have our uh, better demeanors um, on a, on the series um, that's starting this Wednesday, um, same time, same place, noon. Um, Central Time, 1 Eastern, um, and hope you guys can come. It should be super exciting, super interesting. Um, I know I'm fascinated because um, Peggy McIntosh is one of the most important minds in the whole, whole United States when it comes to discussing race. And Merceria Ludgood, I had the honor of um, co-producing with one of our panelists here, Dr. Billingsley. Um, a short documentary on um, on Merceria Ludgood, who's the Mobile County a Mobile County Commissioner, um, and she has just an amazing story and also an amazing mind, um, and is probably one of the um, one of the most one of the more impressive leaders that I've ever met in my life, to be honest. So, um, so that should be a fascinating conversation, um, and of course. Um, one of our other panelists with Dr. Billingsley, which is Dr. Gray. I don't know how formal we're supposed to be talking to each other, but it feels like it's a formal format. Um, it, it is fairly formal, but I don't think that Facebook is working. Okay. Um, let me see. Yeah, last time I did it, it um, it's just flashing at me. Hold on. Oh crap, I just did the wrong thing. Let me try one more time. Let me introduce um, our other panelists and let her start talking while I'm figuring this out. Our other panelist is Jennifer Curtis, who comes to us from a uh, University of South Alabama. Um, and um, Jennifer, maybe you could um, tell everybody where everybody is from while I try to figure this out. Sure, Ryan. Um, as he said, my name is Jennifer. I do uh, come from the University of South Alabama in Mobile, Alabama. Um, Dr. Billingsley is also a professor in, um, at the University of South Alabama as well. And uh, Dr. Gray, um, he is in Norway at a university in which we have discussed many times how to pronounce. And so we're going to let him say that <laughs> because we don't want to mess it up. <laughs> so Dr. Gray, you can Tell us the name of your university and the department in which you are involved while Ryan works out uh, Facebook. Okay, it's you can, in English, it's the University of Bergen. In Norway, it's Universitet i Bergen. Yeah. And I work in the Institute for Pedagogik or the Department of Education, and I do university pedagogy work, which means I try to teach professors how to teach, which is what I did at South Alabama which Amazing. in some ways might be as difficult work as the work we're doing today, but um, not quite as hopeless. <laughs> Although it's not hopeless what we're doing today either. Dr. Billingsley, can you tell us a little bit more about what you do for University of South Alabama for yes. those who may not know? Yes, thank you so much. I'm uh, Joelle Lewis Billingsley and I work at the University of South Alabama in the College of Education and Professional Studies in the um, Department of Counseling and Instructional Sciences. And there I'm an associate professor in instructional design. And uh, I'm just excited to be able to, you know, re revisit this work. Uh, it was over a decade ago that we started it. And I know that's part of our conversation, so I won't go into it too much, but, uh, you know, to really think about your work being uh, relevant, you know, a decade later, it's truly an honor to be uh, associated with this with this work and to be able to have us be able to have this discussion and be able to have tools to continue the discussion. So for that, um, I'm very, very grateful. 
let me thank both of you for starting this work and continuing this work, especially um, at a time like this when your work and your efforts um, are needed most. And so it seems that um, I just got the notification that we're live on Facebook like Ryan needed. Thank you, Ryan. So we're just going to go rolling right on. <laughs> and um, you guys, tell us more about the background, more about the history of your work and the documentary. Just give us some enlightenment for people who may not know about the work that you do and then inform us of where you are now in that work. Okay, you know? I, I guess I'll start since I <laughs> waited for Joelle and she didn't go. But um, yeah, this started, we used to be on a race relations committee for Mobile United and Sandy Forbes, who was the first person I think that logged on tonight. Um, this kind of was her idea to, to make a, a series of videos or web page with little video vignettes on it about race relations in Mobile. And, and it started out with this idea that we would create this picture that would have different hot spots on it and people click on it and just play little short videos and then it just grew and grew we started thinking of people we could interview and thinking there would be no chance that that would happen and then suddenly we had an appointment with that person to interview them and and it just started rolling and rolling and then we had a hundred interviews and we didn't know what to do with it all and so it it just sort of evolved it started out as you know once we kind of gotten the idea that it would be a film where we'd be connecting different people's um, stories and um, interviews together. It became, we settled on four different segments and then we decided to try to make a feature film. But the real work was done in the segments. Uh, I'll, just, you. Go ahead, Jennifer. No, no, no. I was just saying thank you for that. Um, because we need to know that background to understand, you know, what's happening here today. But, yeah. Yeah, I just would just continue to add, you know, in that process, we were able to talk with people, hear their stories, and to learn more. I mean, it was really a learning experience for me to be able to hear about structures and to be able to see how, um, you know, all these different systems played out in the lives of people. And I, I just think that just listening to stories and having these conversations during the process of the movie was so helpful for me. And so uh, part of what we wanted to be able to do is create that for others. So as we were thinking about, you know, community conversations and how we are to engage and having a starting point, uh, this series allows for us to do that. Can I geek out for a second? Um, I'm just curious, you guys, neither of you were, since I'm a filmmaker, um, I'm always fascinated by um, motivations of new filmmakers. Um, can you guys hear me okay? I'm hearing some kind of weird little feedback. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm curious for each of you, like, um, you know, what, what, what excited you about film as a, as a medium for this message? And, um, and I guess what scared you about the process? <laughs> Go ahead, Joe. Well, this is my first, it's my first film to be involved in producing. And so it was an amazing experience. We knew that in order to really capture the stories, we needed to use, utilize video. And, you know, when, when Sandra Forbes asked us to go out and start interviewing, you know, um, and plot for that little seed money to get these, the, get the camera and all the things we, we needed, you know, I really thought that uh, you know, it would just be that, like we would go, we'd do the stories. I had no idea that we'd be able to really capture such, such meaningful, insightful information um, that would be able to benefit others. And so that's really what uh, I believe this series ended up being. But in terms of working with film and video, like that for me was a very new experience and has really sparked an interest in me that I really didn't know I had. So since then, I've been able to you know, work with Ryan and be able to work with students on different projects to tell stories. And, and for that, I, I believe it all started with Mobile and Black and White. Yeah, for me, I, I was working at UAB in Birmingham and um, was their web guy and the online learning guy at the School of Public Health. And we decided people wanted us to um, videotape lectures that guest lecturers would give and put it online. And so then we sort of 
suddenly we had this three or four person video shop that we're making hours and hours and hours of a video you know start out as online lectures but it became we were making sort of small films and things like that and so then i found my way to south alabama and had sort of gotten out of the video business but then this came along and then it started you know i didn't know what i was doing when i started this film and i still don't really know what i was doing um and i got i got lucky um brian butler who's not with us today but he um he, he was working at a, the, the TV station in Pensacola and our wives were friends back in college and somehow we got connected and, and he, he taught me a lot. And then a few other people like Dave Walker at South Alabama, who's now at Athens State, he, he helped me a lot. And, and so it, we pulled it out somehow. Um, but it was, this wasn't really about making a film. This was about trying to make a difference, I guess. And, and it just kind of grew and we got um got lucky and you know i'd like to answer the second part i think of your question ryan which was about sort of like you know challenges sort of a part of this you know experience and i wasn't one to talk about race like that was not what i did i did it with my family my close friends but talking about race in public was never something that i was that i did that i was comfortable with that I even wanted to do because I felt like there were some risks associated with it. And I felt like that um, I was not necessarily gonna be that person where I worked and uh, you know other circles that I was in. So this was not something that I was always comfortable doing. It was it's only over time that I've been more comfortable talking about race and, uh, and talking in public about race. But at first I was not the person who would ask questions around it who would, you know, be able to try to see, you know, how can we improve these environments, these outcomes that, you know, types of things that I talk about now, um, all that was a progression and in growth. And so uh, I am encouraged by that because I think that as I grow, I've learned that there's even more that I can learn and that I can do. Yeah, one of my favorite things in this process was watching Joelle sort of, you know, how she she find, found her voice and found her wings and just it was it was really powerful to witness that she came out of her shell. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> what did so uh, I love that for you? I love that so much for both of you guys to be able to work together. So let's talk a little bit more about the film itself. Like, tell us about the strengths of the content. Tell us about the process of making it, the story, the concept. Bring that into light for us, for those who may not have seen the film or those who have seen the film, maybe want to get a little bit more backdrop of understanding the segments. Well, we, um, one of the first things that happened was that um, Sandy Forbes sent me to Ole Miss, University of Mississippi at Oxford to go to a, a, a full day workshop on structural racism. And it was led by a guy named Terry Kelleher, who's going to be on our panel next week for segment two. And I mean, I knew about systemic racism to some degree, but the way that they explained it and made it so clear um, about how racism doesn't really function the way that we think it does on an individual level. You know, when we think of racism, usually um, we think of as racist as in bad individual people doing bad individual things and and while i don't want to say that's not a problem and it, it seems to be coming much more of a problem these days but the where race really functions in people's lives is at the institutional level and at the structural level which is sort of the intersection of different institutions and historical structures that have been built up in our society so um that you know, racism can keep functioning in our society, even though there's no racist making it happen. There's, nobody's intending it to happen. It's just these processes have been going on for so many decades that unless we try to undo them, uh, then they'll keep going. And, and we just kept getting lucky. You know, we interviewed Stephen Black and then we, and he told me to interview Brian Stevenson. And I'd never heard of Brian Stevenson. And I went and spent 45 minutes with him and that's probably the best 45 minutes of my life. And then we found out that Peggy McIntosh was gonna be at a conference 10 hour drive away. And then I just emailed her and said, hey, 
well, can I interview you? And she said, sure. And so I drove 10 hours so I could interview um, uh, Peggy McIntosh. And then we got to interview Hank Aaron and we got to interview John Powell. And it was just, it just kept getting better and better and uh, you know, more and more great things. There's three times as many wonderful things on film that we couldn't squeeze into the, into the, into the actual documentary. That's amazing. Um, Joel, could you give us more about um, the concept of the story and the building of these people that you interviewed and, and what came of that and the influence that it had after you were able to get these amazing interviews? Yeah, you know, this combination of uh, local people in Mobile and um, people that Rob has mentioned in terms of who we were able to have access to and to be able to talk with, you know, that combination, I think for us, uh, allow for us to have uh, tools to be able to start conversations. And one of the things that I've learned, especially in workplaces and uh, places where you're, um, you know, doing service work, you know, sometimes it's just starting the conversation that, you know, really hinders us. It's a challenge for us. And so as we were doing the work, how this all came together was, you know, how can we help this conversation move forward? How can we help dialogue uh, sort of move to action? And part of what we really were able to see is that we just need a starting point, especially when we're not in crisis. The work that we were able to do in the city of Mobile uh, was uh, out, of, out of sort of an issue that ha happened, but what if we were to work on uh, race and work on equity and equality when we're not in crisis? What would happen then if this were a continuous, continuous effort? And so sometimes with that, we need a starting point. We need a way to engage with, in, in, with each other uh, civilly and be able to have conversations that can actually lead to how we change, how we um, progress, how we're more inclusive, how we are to do things that um, create different outcomes. And so I think as we were moving throughout the progress of making the movie, we realized that that is the very thing that we wanted to be able to do was to provide that, that starting point and provide guidance on how to actually identify these systems in which we're living, functioning, and um, you know, that are creating outcomes that we sort of see and be like, hey, this, why is this this way? But be able to work backwards and understand that it's not only about how I get along with my coworkers or how I get along with others in the community, but how can we together look at these systems and, and understand why the outcomes are the way they are? I think that's pretty amazing. I think both parts of the work have created um, an avenue for you guys to create conversations today. And some of the main things you actually said, I think is the reason why we're here. I think I'd love to hear from both of you guys, you know, why are we having these discussions and what, why is that work important now? Robert, you want to tell us more about that? Yeah, I, you know, in some ways that's, when we started this, you know, in 2010 and it came out in 2014, we were having to convince people that this was an issue. Um, at least not all people, but um, most, most white people thought that race was in the past and that we didn't have these issues anymore and that we should all be colorblind and that we were post-racial America. Um, and so we were trying to, some of the first part of the film was trying to convince people that yes, we need to, we need to look at this more closely. Just because people aren't being as openly racist as they used to be, there are still forces in our society that were creating all of these inequities. And what's been happening over the last several weeks has really brought to the forefront I think people are now beginning to understand that there's something more than just individual bad actors out there. Um, you know, you keep having these um, usually unarmed black males being killed by white police officers at an alarming rate. And it's not just because that one bad cop kind of got there and it gets covered up because it, it, it just, there are systemic structural things going on. Um, the, the things that lead to the fact that this point is made in the film several times that, you know, 
what zip code you're born into can really determine the shape of your life. And, and that is very true. And I think people are starting to realize that now in ways they didn't 10 years ago. Absolutely agree. I think, I think that is an important reason why the conversations are relevant to today. And I think the work that you have done is important and I think is pertinent to um, the conversations that we're having now. So can you guys tell us more about the series and the conversations and discussions that will be had here that you've created? I think earlier Dr. Billings mentioned the dialogue to action. Can you explain more about that and what those dialogues are going to be about, what, that, what those actions will become or what they will look like for us? Sure. Um, we, we realize that, um, you know, there have been situations where we've had conversations and maybe it did not lead to action uh, for various reasons. I think part of it is initially there has to be a commitment for an individual or a group or an organization to really take on this work. And that's what we're encouraging right now is that um, if you're an individual or if you're in a group uh, or if you're at your workplace, um, we want you to engage individually and and as a group, um, because when you are committed to really being able to dive into where we are in our community, where you are in your workplace and in your social circles, um, when we're really willing to do the work, um, we can move to action. Um, but the one, I think, determinant factor is that, you know, are we committed to going through a process that will allow for us to move from dialogue to action? And so that's what we're encouraging. That's what we are really, um, you know, find it really important for us to be able to have action items uh, at the end of a conversation over a period of time when we've had time to grow, to listen, and to hear others' perspectives. Uh, part of what we want to be able to do is engage with groups. And so if you sign up, we'll be posting up uh, information. If you want to sign up to participate, we'll send you a guide um, to follow along with us for the next five weeks. And uh, each of those weeks will be uh, opportunities for you to see the segment for you to participate in the live panel on Wednesdays at noon, and then also for you to be able to have discussions outside um, with your group, or if you're an individual, we will put you in a group if you'd like to, uh, and be able to have discussions and hear each other. And then after that, we will make sure that you have opportunity to collect data in the community to help you be more informed, and then lastly, to be able to create an action plan moving forward. And so this work um, is building on the work that we were able to establish years ago when we were doing community conversations, but now we're um, emphasizing the action piece even more now, and uh, we've set up a structure for uh, groups and individuals to be able to participate. Let me, let me just jump in right here too, since you made that plug. Um, this, um, this conversation we're having right now, we're um, gonna go ahead and let um, attendees and people on Facebook, I just posted um, asking for shares or sharing, if anybody wants to share a question for this panel, um, to go ahead and do that on, if you're on the Facebook Live, to do it there. If you're on this um, Zoom um, webinar, then you can, I think you can, um, add questions to the Q&A section yeah. or to the chat section, I believe. Um, so um, just gonna go ahead and put that call out there right now. And um, once we're done with this sort of setup, then we can start taking questions or um, making comments on that. Um, Rob, did you have anything you wanted to add to what Joelle was just saying? I don't think so. No. Um, I, I had a question and it's kind of a combination of content and um, filmmaking. When you guys made the film, uh, or I should say after you made the film, um, you did some film festival stuff. I know there was a whole series of conversations that the segments were used um, here in Mobile. In fact, a lot of people remember that if anyone's from, lived in Mobile at that time and were even marginally interested in race relations or you know these kinds of topics. Um, it was pretty well, um, you know, I mean, it was both, sort of well marketed and well, people knew about it. It was well attended, you know, all those kinds of things. So tell us about that experience about like bringing this work to the public, their reactions, your reactions to their reactions, you know, that kind of thing. 
Yeah, uh, one of the things that I learned about this work is that, you know, people engage at, at different levels and then create an environment for uh, that type of engagement is really, really important. And so uh, we were, uh, we wanted to provide opportunities for community members to participate, to have conversations. And so what we did, uh, we were uh, at public libraries, uh, we had we trained facilitators, we went out to um, public libraries and held meetings uh, in major areas of the city, as well as had large gatherings uh, for uh, people to hear from guest speakers and, and things like that and people to engage. Uh, what we could not get at that time was an entity, an institution, an organization to um, engage over a period of time and to really bring the work into their workplace. Um, now, because I was at the University of South Alabama, um, college education went through a series and I can tell you, um, they are, um, we were able to move to action because now we are partnering with Williamson um, Preparatory Academy and that work came out of conversations that started in Mobile and Black and White and continued around current events creating that safe environment. And so that is just one example of how we're able to move from dialogue to action because through those conversations, we were able to create an environment where people felt like they could, you know, be themselves, express themselves and um, provide the perspective to everyone. And that alone, uh, along with um, sort of identifying where we could help with our, our expertise and our experience, now there's a collaboration with the school that I don't, I don't believe would ever happen had we not started those conversations. So I do believe, you know, the work that we did with the city, the work that we were able to do with college education and, and others that maybe um, we're not aware of, um, you with commitment, uh, we can actually find action items and things that we can do uh, to change the outcomes that we're seeing. First, be aware and then change them. Yeah, and I think I'll add that some of the things that I learned in this process that I think are important for anybody doing this kind of work or any kind of work where you want to change the way people think about things is, um, you know, I'm, I'm an academic and I've been in the academy for my entire adult life. And in, in the academic world, you try to, to live by arguments and logic. But one of the things that John Powell said when we saw him was, the way you change people's hearts is and um by telling stories and then when we started doing this making a documentary film and i didn't know anything about making documentary films i was reading you have to tell a story and that that was the hardest thing for me to get my head around was how do you take these things that, that need to be argued that need to be about logic and truth and and how can you couch that in stories that make people change and also you can't get people to change just by letting them see a film you know you can sit there and watch an hour and a half movie and you get moved no matter how good it is and you get fired up and then you go back out in the world and two or three days later the world changes you back into who you were before and, and so i think it's important that this process over time happens that you watch a segment and then you have a discussion and then you think about things that you're supposed to think about for a week and then you come back and watch the next one. And so that you keep coming back and refreshing and, and, and deepening your understanding of things and, and hearing more stories. I mean, the, the most powerful things I saw in this communicate in the conversation series was not anything that we did or anything in the film. It was hearing people share stories across the racial divide and people on both sides changing their their perspective because we we all come into the world with this very narrow perspective and we think it's the way everybody else sees the world but when we see where other people are coming from and how other people understand things and how their truth is different than than mine that starts changing people and and they really approach things in a different way I, let me uh, jump in uh, yet another plug. I'm the guy with all the plugs today. Um, so we have started in tandem with um, this series um, where we've launched um, a mobile and black and white YouTube channel. So please find that. 
Um, one of the things that, um, again, I'll plug because um, after this experience, I know um, Dr. Billingsley went on to produce many short documentary films, um, a lot of them with me and my students at Spring Hill College, um, but um, also is currently producing the film that um, we're working on together as well. Um, so that um, that notion that Rob was just sharing about like how important personal stories are and how difficult it is to meld really important logical rational kind of you know arguments and conversations with real people's story it's a it's a difficult difficult task and um, filmmakers of all stripes have discovered that um, and um, so one of the one of the other outcomes then of mobile and black and white was um, this um, series of short documentaries um, that we've been producing for the last several years that are personal stories. So we take we take mobile and black and white, the original film and the original segments as kind of our foundational text. Um, like this is what our work is based on, is what these people have said and what, you know, these concepts, the way that they've been expressed and the way that they've been constructed um, and the lens through which we see the entire world. Um, we now can go out and tell stories of individual people um, at all different sorts of intersections of race. In fact, um, well, yeah. Um, so you'll find a playlist um, at, on the YouTube channel. Um, again, it's just mobile and black and white, um, the YouTube channel. So please subscribe to the channel. Um, you can see the segments. We'll be um, releasing each one of the segments each week. So the first segment has already been released there. Um, and um, after our discussion on Wednesday with um, Peggy McIntosh and Merceria Ludgood, um, then segment two will go up on YouTube. Um, so you can go and watch that in preparation for the following week's um, discussion. So that's kind of the, the format of this series over the next several weeks. Um, and um, so us, alongside of that, you'll see on the YouTube channel, we've started putting um, those document, those short documentary films that I was talking about of individual people's um, stories and um, interactions with race. Um, they're super interesting, super fascinating. Um, one of them will, um, ho hopefully of all of those that are there, you'll find one um, that, you know, kind of touches your heart um, and you'd be willing to share it and share our channel um, with everybody. Um, they're all, they're all about um, five to 10 minutes. So they're all, you know, short, nice little stories, but, some of them are super powerful. Um, some of them are just really interesting, you know, so hopefully you'll find some content there that you like. Um, so um, Rob and Joelle, uh, the one other question that maybe I had for you too is in this moment, you know, thinking of mobile and black and white as a foundational text where you have Brian Stevenson and Peggy McIntosh and John Powell and you know, all of these amazing, amazing thinkers. Um, how does mobile and black and white, you know, help us understand, you know, what's happening? I know you've already talked about that some, but um, maybe you can make it a little bit more explicit to the moment we're having now and why we keep having these moments. Um, I don't know how to answer oh, yeah. that. Rob, you start. <laughs> um, started getting all these questions in the chat, so I'm not sure how much I heard of what you were asking, but. Um. <laughs> I'm not good at this stuff. This is hard. Um, you know, it, uh, in some ways, things are different now than they were. And I don't want to be too, um, too bombastic about that. But, but I, I think that, you know, political correctness for all of its problems and um, issues it it sort of took the n word away from a lot of people and it it made it socially unacceptable to be a racist uh and and i think that while it's still not acceptable to be a racist we've changed what the definition of racist is i think uh, and i i've kind of come to the conclusion that er, each individual person's definition of racist is anything that's more racist than I am. So, so that you can have the, the KKK says they're not racist. And you have all of these 
people today with you know hateful things on their um, on their signs and on their Facebook feeds talking about how Black Lives Matter is a liberal lie, um, that kind of stuff. And, and those people would say they're not racist. And I don't know how they can deal with that. But, you know, we have, we have all these very important voices. And we also have some very eloquent local voices. You know, one of my favorite things about the film is we have all those famous people that you um, named, as well as Michael Eric Dyson and Tim Wise and, and several other people. But we also have Jim Flowers and Carlos Finley and Mercuria Ludgood and Fry Gayard and J.D. Crow with his cartoons saying wonderful things. I mean, I, my favorite line in the film is something that Carlos Finley says. Um, you know, he's surrounded by all these famous people, but he's, he's saying it very powerful, still brings chills to my spine when I hear him say it. So there, there are things that need to be said and there are things that people need to hear because one of the, the things we truly really tried to do with this was that, you know, there's probably 15 or 20 and maybe even 35% of the population. There's, there's nothing you can say to them. They're, you know, they're entrenched in their ways. They're by most definitions, what we would call racist and we're not going to change their minds. And then there's another 20 to 35% who are very committed to the cause and are trying to actively be anti-racist. And then there's a, you know, another 35% in the middle who mean well, they have good intentions. They just live a life where they don't have to see it. Um, another one of my favorite moments in this experience was when we first time we ever showed segment one live, um, my friend and, and Joel's boss, I guess now, um, Trace DeFurek was on the panel and, and he said, you know, I'm sitting here as a white man and I can go through my entire life and never think about race and it won't affect me one bit. Um, and, you know, we as white people, we have the privilege of living our lives thinking that race isn't an issue um, because it's not an issue for us. And having that realization that other people in my life who I love dearly who can't do that is a very powerful recognition to have when, when you realize that those problems aren't my problem, but they should be my problem because they're my friend's problems. Um, and so we, that's still a very relevant message, relevant message that needs to be shared. Sorry, I, I talked too much there. Oh, that was awesome. Thank, Thank you for that. that. Thank you. I really think that there are several reasons why, in my reflection about this work, why we are still talking about it. I think number one, it's hard to look in the mirror. So, you know, I thought, I think about, you know, just, just daily, you know, sometimes it's just hard to look at yourself and like, you know, what, you know, you see the flaws, you see the things you love to be different, all these different things, but sometimes people walk by a mirror, won't even look at it. And I think that there is just some difficulty for us to see where we need to improve. Uh, just the fact of saying, let's do an analysis. Let's see where we are. Some, some organizations, some workplaces don't even want to do that. So that's one reason. The other reason is that when we do talk about it, we may not be deep, go deep enough, partly because we haven't created safe environments. You know, there's a real risk. We saw it in the news today with Bubba having a noose in his garage. Well, part of what we think about is there's a risk when you stand up and advocate for, for something. And if these organizations, institutions in our community don't make it safe for people to have a voice and to do so civilly, uh, you know, one, if there may be silence, and two, you won't ever get to the real issues. I think another reason that we are still talking about it is because we have a lack of knowledge of structures. Um, the structures and that we are seeing the outcomes of, you know, we don't necessarily know the ins and outs of them. And sometimes those who do don't want to share and don't want to help us understand it. 
Another reason why we're still talking about it is because our community in many ways doesn't collect the data for us to actually see what's actually happening. For example, if you uh, don't uh, collect information on certain things and be able to um, uh, determine if there are racial inequalities or if you do have any issues, if you don't collect the data, guess what? You won't know. And sometimes people subscribe to that. I'd rather not know uh, what's actually happening, uh, but, uh, and we can just sort of see, see, just let it kind of continue the way it is. But how can we really critically analyze uh, our communities if we don't take these steps? Um, so um, I guess we have plenty of time, but there's already some questions. Um, and so we'll just put a call out um, to whoever's on here. I know we have several participants on, um, on both Facebook and on Zoom. Go ahead and um, shoot us some questions for the panelists, uh, for any of us for that matter. Um, one was kind of interesting. Um, I imagine you saw that one, Rob, about um, what are the similarities and differences in structural racism between the US and Norway. Um, you know, and you, I guess you could, um, you're a smart enough gentleman scholar um, that you could probably make some make some kind of compare contrast between, um, I guess, those kinds of um, those, that the kind of structural racism that might be seen in a typical suburban setting in the United States, uh, maybe a typical southern setting in the United States, and and maybe make that contrast with what you see or sense in Norway. Yeah, that's a that's a very good question from Runa, and it's um, and it's not easy to answer because there are differences both across Norway, depending on where you are in Norway and where you are um, in the U.S. Things vary quite a bit. But um, one of the things that I noticed, and I live in I live in Bergen, which is on the west coast and is um, the second largest city in Norway, and it's about the same size as Mobile, and I think the, the US is much more consistent in terms of its structural racism. Um, I think interpersonal racism varies a bit, but you know, I, I grew up in Alabama and I went to graduate school in Michigan and I thought that Michigan structurally was far more segregated and um, you know, more systemically racist than, than Alabama was perhaps, um, and, or at least as much while pointing its finger at, at Alabama. I think I have seen, and you know, again, I, I moved like a week before um, the Trump campaign started. So I, things have changed since I've been there, but, um, and I wasn't supposed to drop that name, but, um, but it's, it's different now. But I have seen more instances of microaggression kind of um, personal things that look sort of racist in, in Bergen than I have in, um, in Mobile, because maybe it's, there aren't that many minority people, you know, Norway's a very white place. Um, but you see on the, on the train that runs through the you know, middle of town, the, the sort of primary artery for public transportation that I ride every day on the way to work, you, you know, you'll see a thing where there'll be a, a person sitting on the, on, the, on the train and then somebody sits down next to them and they get up and move to another seat. I, I don't think I would have seen that um, as much, but, but it's still, you know, I think Norway does a better job of being aware of the structural issues. Their, their government is much more proactive in protecting against that because we are in so much denial that there are systems and structures. You know, we have this individualistic, you know, we are America, the great American eye, and everything is about self-determination and the self-made man. And we have, um, so we deny that there, that, there are, that there are structures and that there are anything is systemic. And so we refuse as policymakers to do something about that, um, especially in Southern states like Alabama 
whereas Norway, they have problems, and I don't want to say they don't have problems, but they are at least trying to, to make things as even and equitable as possible, whereas we're trying to enforce the inequality. We have a power structure that's been around for a couple hundred years, and we, we put everything in our society in a, in a way to keep it that way. Um, it, it, taking on that, I, I want to connect two dots here then. Um, you know, Rob mentioned that it doesn't seem like states or institutions or municipalities, you know, and that's changing a little bit now. In some, in some cases, they're trying some pretty dramatic change. Um, but connecting that to a comment that I can't remember now if it was on the Q&A or on, on Facebook, I think it might have been on Facebook about um, what we can do in the home right? Like teaching our kids. So I, um, I want to put that to Joel. If, if someone wants to make a change in their lives, one place they could start is in their home, um, especially if the mayor's not doing anything or the governor's not doing anything, you know, that kind of thing. So um, Joel, I guess I'm assuming that the questioner was speaking about white families. Um, and since I'm in a white household, um, uh, what would you say? to white families and to white parents. Um, what could they do? What could they say to their kids? What could they do with their kids to affect change in their own home in the hopes that that can spread? So my first thought goes to how my parents modeled for me. Uh, they made my home a safe place where I could come home and tell them what someone said, what someone did, what made me feel uncomfortable, why as a child I was singing Dixie. And I mean, those were the types of things that I could go home and, and talk about. If you create a safe environment, number one, in your home where your children or your spouse can talk with you, that's, I think, the first thing. Because you can't move into helping, you know, with understanding and perspective if you don't know what's happening. And so you have to create a space for a conversation in, in, in your home. The other thing, I, I go to another experience that I had, and, and I was so grateful to be able to have a conversation at the Junior League of Mobile when we were doing these conversations. And there was a question about, um, there was one mom, and she said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful that I'm able to send my child to private school, um, and I, I, I feel really great about that. I don't want to feel bad about that, but what, what, is, what is it that I can do? And so part of what I, I said is that, you know, how many other experiences does your child have with children who are not like her? And how do you create those experiences? You know, how do we um, help our, our children and each other understand and be in pro closer proximity to people who are not like us, maybe even figuring out how to learn more about uh, a group in our community. For example, another example, when we were doing this work and collecting stories, I said, I want to learn more about um, immigration and I want to learn more about people who are in our community and I learned in many places I went to the Guadalupe Center and learned there and sat there uh, with Brittany who was working with us at the time and she said um, you know let's go to the Guadalupe Center but there was an initiative to go and learn I know we're in the season of COVID so some of these things may be a little bit more difficult but there are ways for us to provide safe environments for conversation for us to be able to you know talk about things and correct uh, each other right provide perspective in terms of how to be inclusive of everyone and how we are to you know sort of raise them up if you realize there's some things in in us as parents that may not be right let's deal with that so we don't pass it down uh, to the next generation. Uh, so those are some of the things that I think of based on my experiences is that we model, uh, you know, model for our children, that we um, provide closer proximity to people who are not like us. And that can be done in the media, that can be done through technology and other ways. And then really thinking about, you know, who is it that I want to learn more about and where can I have a safe space to do that? Um, I I want to extend that one more level, if that's all right, and probably bring Jennifer into it too. Um, you know, um, we hear, um, and this is this is one of, the, and, and Rob already mentioned it before, but this idea of color blindness, 
Um, and you hear it in both the white community and the black community. And, and, um, and we have to always kind of put the caveat out there that we know that we're speaking um, to, all, to all people and all people, people of all colors. Um, but that in this particular case, there's a, there's a particular dynamic that's specific to the white community and the black community. Um, and, you know, when you're, I, I'll just give my only personal story, hopefully. Um, you know, I raised my kids in Arizona the first, you know, until they were in junior high um, before I came to Alabama. And we deliberately tried to build a sense of colorblindness. Like we would never point out race, you know, and, and our kids had friends of all races. My oldest was best friends with um, a biracial kid. Um, and we just never, and it was just like the, our ideal, you know, from that suburban perspective is we just don't see color, right? If we don't model that we see color, if we don't acknowledge that we see color, then maybe these kids won't see color either. Um, came to Alabama, realized that was exceptionally naive, um, didn't know it at the time. Um, but then recently I've heard um, a black student um, that's um, in high school and she's like, I just don't know why people see color. Like, why can't everybody, you know, and, and she meant it in a dramatically different way than what I was saying, right? She was trying to wrap her head around how, how people can make a difference or can, can both see a difference and then make a conclusion on that difference, right? That was really her point. Um, so I've rambled too much, but I would love to get both of your perspective on how do we raise our kids to see color because that's appropriate um, and then be able to see past that. I, I, I'll chime in first if okay. you want to go, Joel, but um, were, were you asking, I just want to know, um, I'm sorry. I, were you, when you threw my name in, were you asking for yeah, my, I, I, was, I was, at, I did ask specifically Jennifer and um, Dr. Billingsley, but Rob, I'd love to get your comment too. <laughs> Being that oh, white guy. I wasn't trying to go through my name and I was like, they calling me. <laughs> um, well, I'll be brief because I want to hear their their comments as well. Um, we are talking about personal experiences here, and I think that those are very valid in conversations like these. Um, the same way you raise your children not to see color, I believe a lot of people who look like me can testify that they were raised to see color, to see their own color, to see that, hey, you are a, a black girl that's the only black girl in this gifted and talented class, or, you know, you are, you are a black child in a white world. I was expressing to Dr. Billingsley a book that I read. It's actually right over there. You see it um, on the other side of the ABCs there about um, black lives and black vision in white media and how we have to fixate ourselves as remember at all times that you are black. You are black to that police officer. You are black to that teacher. You are black to that authoritarian. And so, the same way some people teach don't see color, we are taught to always be aware of our color. And so it it teaches, like you said, a sense of, na of naiveness because if you don't see color, you also don't see the injustices and the differences that the color makes. So I think that I think that early on we were teaching, you know, let's not see color, let's not see color, because it unified. It was, it unified. It it, it made things a little bit more equitable, seemingly a little bit more equal if you treat all people the same. The issue is that this particular color of people were not being treated the same, and if you don't see color, then you don't see the maltreatment. And so now in this part of our world, we're having to open our eyes and really look, okay, so hey, we can't, some debates and some conversations, some discussions I've been in, some people that look like me have gotten very indignant and even saying, don't even identify me as a person of color right now. I am a black person because even persons of color have some of the white ideologies about blacks being lesser than and perceived as less than. So we can't even be identified as a person of color anymore. I remember um, the first time I ever heard the word colored as a little girl and my mother, again, having experiences like Dr. Billingsley, my mother explaining to me the history of whites only fountains versus colored only fountains. I remember having a project specifically in sixth grade having to do with slavery 
and and chasing our ancestral roots. And a lot of people may not have these experiences. I know that um, Dr. Billingsley does because I know about her history with the Clotilda and the 110 slaves here in Mobile. And if you don't know, now I'm plugging, if you don't know about that story, you need to find out. It's an amazing story, amazing history right here in the city of Mobile. But for me, I was able to talk to my grandmother about slavery. My grandmother went through slavery. My grandmother, her grandmother, so she shared the experiences of coming from slavery through um, Jim Crow laws, through uh, Great Depression and all of these experiences and then how she was a little girl seeing different things on the plantation and, and all of the stories. So it, I didn't have to go to a history book to see color. I saw it in my history line. I saw it in my life very vividly. Um, and so I think at one point in time, the let's not see color was was helpful. You know, and you may have been, you know, raised to believe that it was helpful because, again, it did unify. If I don't see you as any different than you, then maybe I will love you the same. And I think that was the ideology around that. But I think now we're in a part of the progression that we have to see color, that we can't say, you know, this color is the same as it because it's not the case. And, and it's more evident, it's more forefront and more visible than ever before. But again, would love to hear you guys' feedback on now that you have the dichotomy of one home being raised to not see color and one home being raised to only, to always be aware of your color compared to, along with side compared to other colors. Go ahead, Rob. The question wasn't directed at me, as, I, as was pointed out. Oh, OK. All right. So uh, part of what I'll say is that we have a real revamping to do on the way we educate our children. They're not learning some, in many ways. They're learning incorrect history and definitely not holistic, comprehensive history especially about black people. I think back to what I was taught in the classroom. And uh, I think at home, we're responsible for what our children are learning, regardless of if they're learning at school or from their friends, we have to be the place where we you know, set this record straight, where we help them see the world correctly and accurately. And for so many, uh, I think, if you think about the history lessons that either omitted Black people or just depicted them um, as slaves only, uh, I believe that we have some real work to do. And that's a real area for us, uh, for us to be able to do is think about how our children are being educated about Black people, where Black, black people came from. And, you know, um, it, I think the colorblind piece is is a is an approach. We're all finding out ways that we can uh, cope with how our society looks and our community looks. And I believe that colorblindness and the concept of it is one way for us to deal with it. Uh, I don't think that it's um, I don't think that it really helps us accept that there are different perspectives, that there are different people. I mean, I, I think about all the people from around the world that I see when I go to the market uh, here in Atlanta. Uh, it's totally different from people who never had any exposure, but all of all of the people are different. So we've got to find a way to uh, help, help children and help our families see difference, uh, for to understand their different perspectives, that we have different experiences, and that that is okay. Uh, we've got to be able to do that, and we can't do that under the concept of colorblindness. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just chime in a little bit. Um, I've I've always been troubled by the colorblind idea because uh, maybe it's because when I was a kid, that was the politically acceptable way to say a black person was colored, and now we use the term people of color or communities of color. And so then when you say being colorblind, that sort of suggests that there's something wrong with color. Um, you know, because white people aren't included ever in that people of color or that colored thing. So there's whiteness and there's coloredness or blackness. And so if you can't see color, then that means color is wrong. And we have to pretend it's not wrong when it's not wrong. And so we should just, 
we should celebrate color. We should embrace color and just quit providing values to whether there's color or not. Um, you know, it's, it just doesn't make sense to me to, to give that assignment and to pretend that you're seeing something that you see um, or pretend that you're not seeing something that you do see. That's, um, that was really, that was really good, Rob um, and Jennifer and um, Joel. I guess we're just going to go first names now. <laughs> um, um, I, each one of you said something that just really struck me and I'm going to, and um, so I'm going to encourage people to, um, to go ahead and share this. What we'll do, obviously, I believe once it's on Facebook, it's always on Facebook. Um, so the live version of this should just be able to go back and be rewatched um, or could be shared. Um, encourage everybody to do that. Um, the Zoom version of this has also been recorded. So we will add it to the YouTube channel we already talked about. And I think, was that you, Jennifer, that shared the link? So in the Facebook um, live feed, um, there's also the link to that YouTube channel. So you can go and subscribe. Um, keep up to date on all the new content um, that Mobile and Black and White is putting out. Um, and then um, I guess most importantly, go watch the first segment again. If you already have seen it or if you saw, saw it several years ago, go watch it again to get yourself refreshed on, um, on those concepts. Um, if you've never seen it, great opportunity for you to watch something that might actually change your life. Cause I know, um, when I saw it, it changed my life. Um, and, um, so, uh, that will prepare us for the discussion that we'll be having at 12 noon central time, one Eastern time on Wednesday, two days from now. Um, and, um, we're ready to wrap up. I'm assuming Did anybody want to say anything else. Um, just one more thing. Uh, we will be posting links so that you can sign up to participate. And uh, I want to just say, you know, this team models what we believe our community should do. And these are conversations that are that we have regularly that that we talk. So we like to model the the very thing that we are asking everyone to do. And so that from that I've grown uh, through through the different conversations we've had. So thank you for your for your interest, and we will be providing opportunity for you to sign up to participate. Thank you so much. Last thing I would like to add, if you're looking for the YouTube channel, um, I did plug the link in the chat here if you're on Zoom. So you can find it on, on the Zoom chat or on the Facebook page as well. Also, I want to close by saying I'm a little bit uncomfortable with what it looks like on the screen with the two white guys on the top and the two black women on the bottom of the Facebook feed. I think we should try to fix that. Um, Mine doesn't look like that. I think everyone good. I'm talking about the Facebook feed, not the Zoom oh, yeah. feed. Yeah. But well, the um, that's, how that's how it is online. That's I don't know how to change it. But the the thing I really wanted to say is that the segment will also be shown live on the Zoom feed and the Facebook live feed at 11:15 Central Time, right. which is 12:15 Eastern Time and I guess 6:15 Norwegian Time <laughs> um, on Wednesday. So. You can watch it yes. there if you don't get a chance to watch it before. Yeah, thanks, Rob. I totally missed that. That was one of the other things. So yeah, so you could definitely come and join us at 11.15. Um, if you don't get a chance between now and then to watch that first segment, then we're going to go ahead and do it live at 11.15. Um, it's about 35 minutes, so there will be a little 10-minute break um, between um, the screening of that and um, the beginning of the discussion. So that'll give you some time to come up with some questions. And that was going to be my last thing. Um, was after you see segment one, why don't you shoot us questions on Facebook that we can ask the panel. Um, if you want to do a little research, find out who Peggy McIntosh is and find out who Mercuria Ludgood is, um, then that could help inform the questions you want to ask them um, and, and put um, before them um, relative to um, the segment and the moment we're living in right now. So with that, we'll go ahead and finish. Thank you, everyone. Especially big thanks to all of our panelists here for everything that they do and for all of their insights. So, um, and we'll see you on Wednesday. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. <laughs>